Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Sunday morning service at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Laguna Beach. My name is Pamela Floodman and I will be serving as your worship associate for today. Our Zoom and audio visual text today are Don West Jr. handling the Zoom and Paul Bogdan and Dara Skorecki handling the audio visuals here in the building. And we are very fortunate today to be joined by our guest musician, Sue Bredice. We are, yay Sue! We are delighted that you have chosen to be present with us this morning, either here in the fellowship building where we are masked and physically distanced to keep each other safe or virtually by Zoom. It really is a joy that we have so many ways in which we can join together. And today we welcome back to UUFLB, Reverend James Ford, who is joining us this morning to lead us in a service which he has titled, They Say Unitarian Universalists Can Believe Anything They Want. And he will be helping us to focus on our spirituality as Unitarian Universalists. So welcome, Reverend Ford. We are so very grateful that you have chosen to be with us at UUFLB this morning. Each Sunday, anywhere there is a service held in a Unitarian Universalist congregation, a chalice is lit. The flaming chalice is the symbol of our faith. And I recently found the following words from the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Mankato, Minnesota, words which they use to explain the meaning of the chalice lighting when they have visitors to their congregation. The flaming chalice has become a well-known symbol of our denomination. It unites our members in worship and symbolizes the spirit of our work. The flaming chalice, like our faith, stands open to receive new truths that pass the tests of reason, justice, and compassion. So if you have joined us by Zoom this morning, I invite you to light a chalice or a candle within your home as Reverend Ford lights the chalice for us here at UUFLB. Our chalice lighting words today are from the Reverend Dr. Cynthia Landrum of the UU Church of East Liberty in Clark Lake, Michigan. We light this chalice, the beacon that calls us to love, to justice, to a deepening of the spirit. So thank you, James, for lighting our chalice this morning. At UUFLB, we are a welcoming congregation. I just realized I'll be more welcoming if I take my mask off. There we go. Whatever has brought you here this morning, we welcome you to our community of mutual caring and serious intent to grow as spiritual and moral beings. Many thanks this morning to everyone at UUFLB who works together each week to create opportunities for us to worship together, to be together in community. Our board, our worship committee, Candy and Paul, who make sure the building is ready each Sunday morning for worship and there's fresh coffee. So many of you quietly step up to take care of tasks which need to be done. And I would like to say a special thanks today to Bruce Johnson and John Mendoza, who actually aren't here with us today, but I know they're planning to watch the service later on YouTube. Every month on the first Thursday, Bruce and John organize UUFLB members to prepare a hot evening meal, which is served at the alternative sleeping location in Laguna Canyon. And this is such important work. If anyone wants to learn more about how they could get involved or take part in helping in preparing the meal, 
please talk with me after today's service. And I can also put you in touch with Bruce and John. And I think Candy would probably also be happy to talk with you if you wanted to learn more. Tina as well. Tina's here too. There's a, there's a small team of people who work on this effort. And I realize others might want to get involved. And although there are clearly so many committed hands that work together here at UUFLB, there are always more opportunities, more to be done. And if you are looking for a way to become involved, reach out. And if you are new to our community, please connect with us after the service or during the week if you would like to be added to the email mailing list so you can receive advance notice for each service and for other events. Connecting with each other in this way is the way that we build community and build a strong base from which we can go out and make a difference in the world. So I have two short announcements for today. And the first one is the exciting announcement, which hopefully many of you also received by email, that Reverend Raina Hamry has now begun her work as our quarter time minister here at UUFLB starting June 1st, this past week. And Reverend Raina will be with us next week for the service. So this is due to hard work that was done by the board and the task force that was involved in our ministerial search. And we're very excited to be starting this new time at UUFLB. The second announcement that I have is that our annual congregational meeting will be held on Sunday, June 26th, after the service here at UUFLB. So I hope that you are able to attend the service, again, either in person or by Zoom, and then attend the annual congregational meeting, which I think will start really right after the end of service so that we can get our business done quickly and then move on with the other things that we'll be doing that Sunday. Are there any other announcements that I should make? Good, okay, well, welcome to all. It is good to be together this morning in all of the ways that we join together in worship. So Don will now put a slide up for us with a list of upcoming services for the month of June. And hopefully I got the dates right this time around. I think these are all Sundays. And next week on June 12th, as you'll see, Reverend Raina will be joining with us and leading a service that she's titling In Memoriam with many events occurring within our community, within our nation, within the world for which we want to set aside a time and space for Memoriam together as a community. So that's next week, June 12th with Reverend Raina. And then on June 19th, our own Don West has volunteered to lead a service and that date is the date of Juneteenth. So I know I'm looking forward to that service and what Don has to share with us. On June 26th, that's the fourth Sunday of the month. So that is our social justice Sunday. And Celia Young, who is a member of Tapestry and is recently ordained and is also a committed social activist. Celia Young will be leading the service that day. And I'm actually not entirely sure of the title of her service, but I know that Celia is very involved in running workshops, one of which I was lucky to attend on race and racism from awareness to activism. And Rachel's raised her hand. Rachel, what do you know what the service will be on Sunday, the 26th? Wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to repeat that so the people on Zoom can hear as well. So what Celia has been thinking a lot about recently is fear and cover courage and how we face the challenges that um, come for us. And she's recently been doing work in hospitals where um, I think she's had a chance to learn more about these lessons. So I think that's probably going to be the main topic on June 26th. And then on July 3rd, Reverend Raina will be with us again, and her topic on that date is um, going to focus on two Unitarian Universalist women, um, Frances Watkins Harper, I think I got that the right way around, and Julia Ward Howe. 
Um, so please plan to be together with us for these upcoming services. And following today's service, I hope you have time to stay for a bit and connect with each other. Both those of you who are here in the fellowship building, but will also have an opportunity to connect with our attendees on Zoom during the virtual cafe. And once we close the service, I'll be setting up the laptop up front here so that those of you who want to come and say hello to the folks who are joining us by Zoom can do so. As Unitarian Universalists, we have seven principles which we hold as strong values and moral guides as we build religious community together. And we live out these principles within a living tradition of wisdom and spirituality drawn from sources as diverse as science and poetry, scripture, personal experience. And when I was preparing for our service this morning with its focus on spirituality, I went back to reread and reflect on our third principle. As a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we affirm and promote acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. And so we are so delighted this morning that Reverend James Ford has chosen to be with us and worship and to lead us in an exploration of spirituality. Reverend Ford is an American Zen Buddhist priest and a Unitarian Universalist minister, and he's been a frequent visitor and friend here with us here at UUFLB. Um, he is a member of the American Zen Teachers Association and a member of the Soto Zen Buddhist Association. And you can read more and in fact, listen to his latest interview on his blog. Reverend Ford has a blog titled Monkey Mind. And I noticed today, I'm not sure it's the full title of the blog, but the header says Monkey Mind Easily Distracted. Um, and I could easily become distracted for a long time reading the, the blog posts that are available. You can look back and read previous okay. writings. Um, Reverend James is also the guiding teacher for the Empty Moon Zen Sangha, Zen Sangha. And his most recent book is an introduction to Zen Kwan's Learning the Language of Dragons. But I especially enjoyed the more informal bio that is listed on Reverend Ford's website. So I'm gonna read a little bit to you from that. James has walked the spiritual path for more than 50 years. He has danced with Sufis, studied with Gnostics, lived in a Buddhist monastery and was ordained as a Zen priest. Later, he also ordained as a Unitarian Universalist minister and preached from the high pulpits in old New England churches. James' path has taken him to a life between several traditions, bringing him into a non-dual spirituality. So today, Reverend Ford has invited us to join him in thinking about what is spiritual within Unitarian Universalism. We've got great ethics, he says. We are a voice in the public square, but what drives us? What is our spirituality? So Reverend James Ford has some ideas that he'll be sharing with us today. So thank you again for joining us and I'm looking forward to our explorations today. Our centering thought this morning is from Reverend Edward Everett Hale, a 19th century Unitarian Universalist minister. And it'll be on the slide that Don will be bringing up for you. These words are some of my favorites actually. And they always remind me of how our spirituality can ground us so that we have power to go out and do the work of justice. So please, if you're at home, you can unmute yourself and please join me together in reading the words of our centering thought. I am only, no, only one, one, but still, but still I, am I am one. I cannot, I cannot do everything. everything. But still, but still, I can do something. And because, and because I cannot I do everything, everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can, can do. Thank you. Our opening hymn this morning is number 38 in the gray hymnal, Morning Has Broken. So for those of you who are joining by Zoom, I think the words will come up for you in the chat. 
and many of you probably know the words anyway. Please join with our guest musician, Sue Bredice, in singing this beautiful hymn. Number 38, Morning Has Broken. I'll intro and then there'll be a pause and then we can start singing. Morning has broken like the first morning. Blackbird has spoken like the first bird. Praise for the singing, praise for the morning. Praise for the spring, fresh from the word. Sweet rains, the new fall, sunlight from heaven, like the first dew fall on the first grass. Praise for the sweetness, praise for the morning. Praise for completeness, where is he found? Mine is the new light, mine is the morning, born of the one. Eden saw play. Praise with elation. Praise with the morning. God's good creation of a new day. things I think so far my my favorite part of the day better than the sermon's going to be is one of our number uh slipped into the back room um, um it serves multiple functions one one is I'm sure just coincidentally the direction to the bathrooms um, but as the door opened a herd of very small people burst forth and ran as fast as they could uh, uh, into this room. And, and I love that. I just, there, there, there is something powerful when children are involved, even if it's just, you know, breaking away and making a run for it. Uh, we gather in all the different ways we do in, in our thousand plus congregations across the North American continent in our odd communities uh, um, scattered about the globe. Each of us, you know, has that experience in one way or another, uh, the, the children breaking away, the children running into something. I think we're doing something similar. We take a pause in the week. We allow ourselves uh, to break away from the rhythms of our lives and, uh, and we are running towards something. Uh, it's a great mystery. This is, and I'll talk about it again later, Pentecost Sunday in the Christian church. Uh, this is the birthday of the church, the descent of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I like to think we have uh, such an event every, uh, every Sunday. Uh, uh, doors open, possibilities emerge. Uh, there is something. Uh, um, descending doves, tongues of fire, children uh, coming up to us many, many ways the mystery is revealed in that spirit. Welcome. In that spirit, come dear ones. Let us worship together.
So let us take a moment now to remind ourselves why we come together as a community. I invite you to read these words, the words of our unison affirmation together when and if it feels right for you. If you wish, please unmute your microphone if you're on Zoom so that we can join our voices together and hear the power in our voices. There'll be two screens of words for the unison affirmation. So please join me together in reading. May we, May we be reminded here of our, of our highest aspirations, aspirations and inspire, and inspire to, bring to bring our gifts of love and, love and service to the, the altar, altar of humanity. humanity. May we know, May we know once, once again, again that we, that we are, are not isolated beings, beings but, connected but connected in mystery, in mystery and, miracle and miracle to the universe, to, the universe, to, this, to this community, community and, and to each other. We have come to a time in our service to briefly share the important events that have touched our lives in the past week. We know that our joys, when we share them, are magnified. And when we share our sorrows, we can provide the support and care that are vital for all of us in community. So during this time of sharing our joys and concerns, we have paused the recording of the service. It is as much a blessing to be able to give as it is to receive. And in this self-governing and self-sustaining community, we recognize it is our responsibility to do both and to do both well. So now that we've come to the time for our offering, I want to invite you to give what you will for the work of this fellowship that really means so much to each of us, that has meant so much to those who came and were here before us, and that will mean so much to those who may join us in the future and in honor of the work that we can do together. All of our gifts generously given are needed for this fellowship and for its continued work in the world. So during the time of offering, while Sue gives us some beautiful music, we'll pass a basket here within the fellowship. And the information on your screen also provides additional ways in which you can give. Now, please join us, stand if you're comfortable so that you can sing to each other words of sincere gratitude. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. From you I receive, to you I give, and together we share, and from this we you I receive, to you I give, and together we share, and from this we live. And we come to the turning. 
a moment of contemplation, of meditation, of reflection, of prayer. Of late, I've been thinking about metaphors. Uh, probably the most important reason for a metaphor in my life is the pointing to this is that. Uh, an invitation to the heart, a possibility. There are many basic metaphors to the human heart, standing up, sitting down. Probably the one that most touches me is uh, the taking the path, following the journey. A moment, a heartbeat for us to be quiet, to reflect, to think, to be. Amen. If uh, you really want to annoy a Unitarian Universalist minister, just say, you use can believe anything they want. A few might gasp as if they've never heard such a thing. Others will assure you, assume you're some kind of babbling foolish person. Most will be mildly offended or actually a bit more than mildly. On the other hand, I recall a query from a ministerial colleague asking uh, for a number of us to give short statements summarizing what you use believe. Out of the 10 or so responses she received, well, 10 or so answers. To be fair, um, there were themes. The most common one is that we're united by covenant. That's not quite as esoteric as it might sound, and I will return to it. The other most popular theme is love. It's a fair extrapolation of an old universalist slogan, love over creed. But it is a bit vague, and I'll return to that as well. First, however, as I mentioned at the very beginning of our service, this is Pentecost Sunday the day in the Christian calendar, sometimes called the birthday of the church, the day the Holy Spirit set the early mission on fire. And here we are in this little gathering of Unitarian Universalists, a tradition that, as one wag once put it, has one foot in the Christian way and the other foot outside with pretty much all the weight now out on that outside foot. So here, this place, this gang, we have no creed, a technical religious term for a statement of beliefs expected for anyone joining a religious community. But here we are. What fire burns within our hearts? What spirit has descended upon us? Who are we? Our statement of principles and purposes does a fair stand in for those who really wa want something to hold on to. I love that there's a banner right outside the front door here uh, on a Sunday proclaiming them. But it's not a creed. It's a mutable document. It's subject to change by the vote of representatives of the thousand plus congregations that constitute the Unitarian Universalist Association. The fact that the seven principles we currently list is very likely soon to be eight, 
tells us it's all very much a movable feast. Still, if not a creed, it is a snapshot of what many of us find compelling enough to be that banner of under which we gather. And when asked what we believe, those seven are what is most commonly offered up. However, if you ask me what they are, I probably could get to all seven uh, of our current principles and the draft eighth as well, but it would be a job. And there's more than a fair chance I would miss one, maybe two. However, I can say there is, with, is in fact a spiritual summary within them. And certainly that summary is how I understand the common intuition among us. We assert the individual is something precious. And equally, we note the individual births and lives and returns within a wild web of interconnections. And we are called to the cultivation of this twin insight, as well as its consequences in the work of justice, with the words free and responsible. With interestingly, neither free nor responsible defined. These are for those who care, the first, the seventh, and the fourth of the principles. And this is one of several rubs. You do not need to believe these things to join this church. When I first retired from parish ministry, I took on an interim. One of those things that reminded me I shouldn't have, that I really needed a respite. Uh, uh, was an older member of the church who felt it really important that we all understood one thing clearly. And that was the first principle in the list, and one of the three I consider, consider fundamentally important, was pure, unadulterated nonsense. He insisted people have no inherent worth and no inherent, inherent dignity, which is the exact phrasing of that first principle. He rarely engaged in a conversation that didn't somehow at some point come to that point. And he had been a member of the congregation from just this side of the flood. And, and this is critical, he had just as much right to be there as anyone else. Most people were quite fond of him, and if bored or occasionally annoyed by his campaign, in fact admired his intellect, which was impressive, and his service, which was extensive. He was an integral part of the community. You do not have to believe in the principles to join this church. It would be nice. You may find yourself at odds with the larger majority here if you didn't, no creed. So what's left? Well, this brings us to that covenant thing. On November 11th, 1620, after more than two months hard sailing, including one death and one birth, the Mayflower and its largely pilgrim passengers touched land at Cape Cod. This was far afield from the mouth of the Hudson River where the settlers had a royal patent or charter to establish their colony. They sailed just a little way up the coast of Cape Cod and uninterested in continuing the journey any farther, decided to establish themselves at what we now call Plymouth, Massachusetts. While their days were devoted to building houses, at night they returned to the safety of the ship, continuing to live in the crowded, dark and damp cargo hold that had been their home since the beginning of the voyage. It was in that place they did something amazingly radical. Their original patent, that legal document for establishing a colony, had no legal force where they actually decided to settle. While they would request another charter, they were also aware of many potential difficulties. Their band was a mix of pilgrims who had separated from the Church of England, but also a solid minority of Puritans who had very similar views as the pilgrims, but who had not separated from the established church. 
neither were particularly popular back home. There were also some among them who didn't belong to either camp, but were simply looking for something better. As they drew up their document, they used as their model a church covenant, itself patterned on the ancient Jewish mythical covenant of Israel with God. Of the 102 passengers, we believe 41 of them, representing the large majority of the male passengers, including all save one of the freemen, three of the hired workers, and two of the nine servants, each signed the document. It was two days after they had arrived, November 21st. The document has come to be known as the Mayflower Compact. Its consequences have played out in many directions. Most see in that compact one of the inspirations, and really, it's hard to miss a principal source for our Declaration of Independence, as well if a couple of steps removed of our American Constitution. While the course of European history had largely been based on the subjection of the weak by the strong, this radical idea of social contract, the idea that people should gather together in some equal way was beginning to be whispered across the European continent. But now it had actually happened. With this simple act, a spark was definitely struck and a fire began to spread. And yes, there are nuances to be, nuances to be recalled, principle of which were two things. Women did not have a say and that their little colony already had people occupying the land. Also implicit within that sense of some right to take the land from people deemed inferior or unworthy was a slowly germinating seed of an evil that would allow slavery. That said, and when folded into the whole mix of who we are, reveals something much more complex and, you know, more powerful than any narrative that excludes the wounds and hurts as well as the positive contributions that continue to inform what is shifting and changing and lurching along, creating, I hope, and often I believe, an ever more perfect union. Bottom line, there was a spark of some amazing fire struck in the hold of that small ship, something that brought hope to many people over the many ages. And, and what is most important for us here in this gathering of Unitarian Universalists today is how that document, while very much the ancestor of our whole democratic way of life, it was also at its heart a spiritual document that would in good time directly lead to us. First, the Congregational Churches of New England, then the, the American Unitarian Association, and now the Unitarian Universalist Association. Talk about unintended consequences. For us, a covenant was, welcome, welcome, I'm glad you're here. This is just too cool. And I guess I'm supposed to go on. <laughs> For us, a covenant was, as we can see in the Mayflower document, originally a three-way contract inspired by the founding myth of Judaism as a covenant between God and with and among a people. For us, the covenant became a contract made between people, between you and me. But also, and this is really important, before that larger, out of which we take our being, within which we in time will return. Using the language of the principles and purposes before the interdependent web. Many, although by no means all of us prefer not to use the freighted word God to describe this larger of which we are a part, but truthfully, all words, be it God, the cosmos, the world, Gaia, interdependent web, they all fall short of the reality of this intuition of our hearts. However we name it or resist naming it, we tend to acknowledge within our, we do acknowledge within our covenant that you and I 
live within something. Radical interdependence is a good phrase for this within. Although again, language fails to capture the fullness of it, the majesty of it, the intimacy of it. But in this covenant, we see ourselves as part of something larger, of our highest, or if you prefer, our deepest aspirations. The intuition we're trying to express is that we are connected. And that has consequences. The most obvious of the consequences is how we agree to act with each other. Behaviors are spelled out in our bylaws and in the various policy our governing boards are charged with creating. But they're based in an agreement to be together. And it is amazing what can come of this. We come in as we are. We can stay as we are. There is no compulsion beyond some basic expectations within our relationships. But if we bow into the dance, if we open ourselves to each other, then mystery and possibility flood into our lives. Which brings me to that other interesting assertion in this little list I gathered at the beginning of this consideration, love. Today, in facing all the turmoil around us and the litany is long, the litany is sad, the litany is hard. Some have observed justice is what love looks like in action. Love and justice. We you use hold up that word love as a North Star. Well, many of us, perhaps most of us. There is no creed, but I suggest it is the thing that most calls, that beckons, and that winks at us from out of the dark. And it pulls us into doing things. So what is it? What is love really? Is it in fact anything more than wishful thinking, a vague aspiration to allow us to hope in the face of so much that is ill, in the face of this world, which is definitely on fire? There are several kinds of fire out there. More than a fair question. And we are free to find our own answers. But I have a suggestion. At once as natural as can be, and at the same time an invitation. I actually think my crabby friend was correct. By itself, the first principle doesn't make a ton of sense. But we as you use find what that can mean when we bring the first and seventh principles together. In my opinion, when that holding up of an inherent worth of every individual is seen as arising from something that binds everything together, that interdependent web of existence, Within that dynamic, we get something challenging and living into it, something absolutely life-saving. And it is here that we begin to understand what love actually is, a hint, an intimation, an intuition. This love always remains something we see through that famous glass darkly. We never know completely. So not to hold any definition hard and squeezing the life out of our intuition, but to see the poetry of our lives, the metaphor, the dreams that can become living things. Then, well, miracles can and often do follow. We're offered more than good theory in this pointing to our intimate relationships with each other and the world. I strongly encourage seeking ways to find this intuition ever more deeply, bringing head and heart together as one thing as they're meant to be. The meditation disciplines of Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Sufism, mystical elements in Christianity, there are many possibilities for what most commonly is called mindfulness. Mindfulness, not for commercial use or to get to lower blood pressure or to get a an edge in business. Rather, mindfulness as these practices were originally intended to help us find out who we really are. Finding dis disciplines of presence, revealing us as intimate, as connected to some greater whole. As you use, we are free to embrace these practices from the world's traditions, hopefully not as tourists, but serious seekers of depth, free and responsible. 
they reveal who we are. And out of that comes a love that is a bit clearer and focused and, well, powerful. Me, I find understanding love as an experience. My experience of radical interdependence is critical as I aspire to be of some use in this world. I suggest you may find this calling in your hearts as well. This insight, of course, has direct consequences when we think of specifics, such as our burning ecological concerns, more fire, and our viscerally felt need for racial and economic justice. This insight into our true intimacy is both why and it hints at how we can approach the grave matters of life and death. It tells us how we can meet this burning world. Now, I'm a preacher by trade and inclination. As I draw this reflection to a close in these hard, hard times facing this burning wor wor world, some good news. Which brings us to another symbol of Unitarian Universalism tied intimately to the covenant, tied intimately to these intuitions, the membership book. I find it the great symbol of our lives together of what it means to be a UU. You sign the book, you sign a contract. It is an illegal document, nothing is enforced. There is no compulsion beyond some common decency in dealing with each other. You join the band and you can in fact continue as you always have. But if that were the end of it, it would be a sad thing because by that act of putting your signature into a book signed by generations of people before you and by generations yet to come gathered within our many congregations, you're committing yourself to something. You are joining the band that notices connections and wonders at what it might mean. You are joining a project of clarification for your own heart and seeking the, that North Star which will guide your actions as a friend, as a lover, as someone fully here in this world, this beautiful, suffering, burning world. I'll tell you a little secret. It's hard. If you give yourself to it, often it will hurt. I've heard and I believe you aren't fully owned and you don't fully own this great intimate project until your heart breaks. And then when you still come back. We need to find those cracks in our being, which allow us to see the light within each other. But probably unpacking all that, that's for later. It's a life journey. It's our journey. It's the great and intimate way of Unitarian Universalism. Thank you and amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Our closing hymn this morning is number 168, One More Step. The words will be in the chat and please join Sue by singing along, humming as we join in singing number 168 in the gray hymnal, One More Step. One more step, we will take one more step till there is peace for us and everyone we will take one more step. One more word, we will say one Till every word is heard by everyone, we will say one more word. One more prayer, we will say one more prayer. Till every prayer is shared by everyone, we will say one more prayer 
One more song We will sing one more song Till every song is sung By everyone We'll take one more step Till every song is sung By everyone We'll take one Thank you, thank you, Sue. Mm -hmm. So now is the time for us to extinguish the chalice here at UUFLB and within our homes. We extinguish the flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment, these we carry in our hearts until we are together again. The hour ends. The pause is broken. We begin to turn to the rest of the day, to the rest of the week, to the rest of our lives. I would say the secret moment was intimacy, the opportunity to be together here when the kids broke free and continue to break free and be here with us, showing us the way. In the spirit of our hearts being together, let us depart in peace. And let us hold just a hint of unrest. Amen. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be with God as our Father. Brothers, all are we. Let me walk with my brother in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my soul. 